I taught in Buffalo, New York's toughest inner city junior high, eighth grade. Yeah. I wanted to be the teacher who I wanted to have when I was in junior high. Mm. So I foolishly went to school dressed in my purple corduroy pants, work boots. How mm. am I doing? Oh. Oh, it was terrible. It was so stupid. Did you leave crying the first day? Um, uh, I probably did my fair of weeping. Um, the first day, uh, it got worse as time went on because uh, things just kind of fell apart. The first day they're testing you, then they realize how weak you are, like how, <laughs> how, how bad at this you are. Yeah. I couldn't keep the students in the classroom. I couldn't teach them a lesson. I couldn't do anything. Oh, my God. It's no, so it was sad, Terry. It, it was it's terrible. Like... And, and, and... You, had, you were a, a no, teacher so with realized... the personality of a substitute. First of all, I just want to say, you know, people say, there's no way of firing teachers. They fired me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm living proof. So that was me talking to Terry Gross at a live show back in 2015. And that excerpt is in the failure chapter of Waiting for the Punch, Words to Live By from the WTF podcast. If you want to read what Terry and 160 other notable people have to say about life, love, family, addiction, depression, death, and redemption, you know, the little things, pre-order your copy now. Go to WTFpod.com and click on the book links or go to MarkMarinBook.com. You can still upload your receipt on the pre-order order page to get a signed book plate from me and i've been signing some book plates people signing stacks of book plates all right let's do the show all right let's do this how are you what the fuckers what the fuck buddies what the fucking ears what the fuck nicks what the fuck oh crats What's going on? I'm Mark Marin. This is my podcast, WTF. I'm a little amped. I'm a little amped. Got a lot of clarity. Got a lack of filter. A lot of things going on in my mind. Not so much around me in the real world, but I'm grateful for that. Things not going on is fine, considering that bad things could be going on and are going on every day all around the world. Not for me today. I'm grateful for that. I will say this in in terms of... Uh, you know, what's happening and what you can do to help the folks on the ground in Houston and Louisiana. Uh, a lot of people are wondering how to donate to the relief effort. Here are a few suggestions uh, just to keep in mind. Make sure you do your own research on the groups you're giving to. Know where the money you send is going and what it's being used for and, and, and make sure it's being used for the relief effort. Uh, with that in mind, local groups are often the best option uh, because they're working directly on the relief effort from the ground right there. We use uh, Charity Navigator to do research on charities, but there are other helpful research sites out there like uh, uh, Give Well and uh, Charity Watch. Uh, we've made donations here at the show uh, to the Houston Food Bank and the Houston SPCA. Uh, both are rated the highest possible four stars on Charity Navigator, and their volunteers have been working around the clock on this relief effort. They're doing great work, and they need all the support they can get. But like I said, people, do your own research. It won't take long. Uh, those research sites make it very easy. And give what you can uh, to the places that you think will help. But try to give. These are times for giving. People are in trouble all, the, all over the world. That's just some information I thought I'd share with you. Today on the show, Steve Jordan is here. Steve Jordan, the uh, amazing drummer from the uh, original Letterman show, from SNL, from many records, uh, uh, the uh, the expensive winos with Keith Richards. He's drummed with Neil Young. He's drummed with everybody. Neil Young, everyone. He's got his own label now. He's got a new album coming out. It's out now, actually. Uh, it's called uh, Garage Sale by his band, The Verbs. He also produced the latest... Um, Robert Cray record. Remember Robert Cray? Robert Cray was great and is great still. Uh, the album is called Robert Cray and High Rhythm. It's produced by Mr. Jordan. He's also got, uh, Steve's got a, uh, a show on the Sirius. He's got a show on the Sirius XM channel 106 called Laying It Down with Steve Jordan. I was excited to talk to him because I've, you know, he was one of those guys that was sort of the backbeat of my childhood in a way. Or at least since I started watching David Letterman in college. And I always liked him. I always thought he was a great drummer. And I was always excited to get an album that he was playing on. Played with Keith a lot. So we talk about Keith. We talk about the Stones. 
talk about Cray, talk about jazz. It's a good talk all around, and he's a good cat. I like music, guys. I learned some things about the drums. Uh, oh, another thing I wanted to say in a more self, uh, self-promoting self way is that uh, my new comedy special, uh, Too Real, is what it's called, premieres on Netflix next Tuesday, September 5th. So go ahead and add that to your queue, and it will be there for you to watch when it's streaming next week. I talked to a couple people about it who watched it. I haven't watched it, you know. I watched it when we edited and, uh, but since then, I haven't really sat down and taken it in. And I was very happy that the two guys that were, you know, doing pieces on me about it seemed to very, to be very into it. I am very happy with it. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm good with it. it. It came together well. Some of the jokes that I thought, uh, you know, might not be as relevant, uh, now are, are actually more relevant, which is exciting. And I'm proud of it. So I hope you watch that. It's Mark Marin, me. Show's called the uh, special's called Too Real on Netflix. Netflix? No, Netflix. Uh, on Tuesday, I think it's, it's September fifth. It's the Tuesday, right? All right. Okay. So what what's happening with you people? Where where was I last time? Quitting nicotine? I'm still quitted. I am still quitted. I'm off. Now it'll be uh, by the time you listen to this, unless I fucking break down today. Let's see, Sunday. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, tomorrow will be five days. So Thursday, when you're listening to this, I'll be five days off the nick. And it's uh, it's a little better than when I talked to you on Monday. It's a tough thing. to The habit of it is tough. You know, I, I deal, like, whenever I have to come out here, whenever I have to talk to somebody, I'm like, I need I need things. I need a thing. I need the thing. And I wander around. But I, unfortunately, I've been eating a lot. I'm trying to eat healthily. But I got to do something. And I'm trying to, I'm trying not to justify it or rationalize it. I got to assume that it's good not to be eating, you know, eight to 12 nicotine lozenges a day to the point where I'm sick and my eyes are crossing by the end of the day. I have to assume that I'm giving some of my organ system a rest. I got to assume that my kidneys are relieved. My pancreas is relieved. My stomach is relieved. Things are relieved. The caffeine, I'm drinking tea, which is caffeinated, but I'm off the coffee. So, uh, I don't get that craving to match it. So, yeah, every time you drink coffee, the caffeine wants to be matched. It wants to be matched by nicotine, and and vice versa. You do some nicotine, it would it demands a match with caffeine. It's just the way it works, man. It's the way it works for me. I don't know who you are, or what your life is, but that's the way it works over here. Um, I'm gonna lay off, getting all worked up about uh, the world today, if, if you don't mind. Because of the nicotine withdrawal and because I'm kind of floating, I don't seem to know what day it is or what time it is. I'm not as thorough in checking in. I'm feeling very in the in the moment when I'm driving because I'm withdrawing. You know, I'm taking unnecessary risks behind the wheel, not looking for thrills just because I'm so in the present. I think I got the timing aced. Everything's aced. When you're fucking amped up and your body's withdrawing and your whole being is craving for the outside world to make things right, you're checked in, man. You are tapped in. You are, you know, you are, you know, hooked up with the timing of reality. So there's that moment of slow motion where you know, I'm changing lanes and making left turns and doing shit where I'm like, I don't even think like, can I make it? I just think I'm making it. And, uh, hopefully that doesn't backfire. But right now, I'm enjoying the zen. You dig? All right. Today's episode is brought to you by uh, the new Paramount Pictures film, Mother. I don't know if you've seen the trailer for this thing, but it looks pretty fucking nuts. Can I say fucking? Maybe not. It's a, a couple's relationship is tested when uninvited guests arrive at their home, disrupting their tranquil existence. You watch that trailer, man, and you're going to be like, what? How does that even do it justice? And because it's from filmmaker Darren Aronofsky, who did Black Swan and Requiem for a Dream, uh, you know it's going to be a trip. And I, I swear to you, though, I mean, those movies were trippy, man. Requiem for a Dream. St- if I think about certain scenes in that movie, I can get tripped out and disturbed right now. I'm going to do it. Oh, God. I just did it. Uh, Mother stars Jennifer Lawrence, Javier Bardem, Ed Harris. Yeah. Michelle Pfeiffer. Awesome. Two great actors who are only getting more intense and beautiful and better as they get older. 
those are uh you know those are just a few people that are in it good actors all around so mother is uh the movie it's a riveting psychological thriller about love devotion sacrifice and the advance word is that it's darkly intelligent well acted and rumored to be one of the most controversial films to come out of hollywood in a long time it's exactly the kind of smart and scary psychological thriller darren aronofsky is known for and it's sure to get a lot of people talking after the credits have ended my friends Mother is out in theaters September 15th. Go see it and don't miss the movie everyone will be talking about. All right. Whew, boy. Yeah, a little disjointed with the nicotine. I'm also on Flonase. I've been having some sinus congestion. I hope that's what it is and not a tumor behind my face. Let's get on with it. Steve Jordan is here. He's a great drummer. And as I said, he's got a show on Sirius XM, Channel 106, called Laying It Down with Steve Jordan. He's got the uh, the new album with his band, The Verbs, called Garage Sale. He's uh, produced uh, Robert Cray's new record, High Rhythm. That's out. But this is a this was a blast. This is a really fun conversation. Me and Steve Jordan, the drummer. Nice to see you, Steve. Good to see you. Yeah, you, you're familiar to me from way back. Yeah, yeah. I remember. I remember there was a dreadlock period. That, absolutely. <laughs> that the I was the first person to yeah. wear dreadlocks on network television every day uh, on the Letterman show. That's right. You were the first drummer for Letterman. I was the first drummer and uh, uh, yeah, co-founder of the world's most dangerous band with Paul. With Paul, I, actually, the band. The band was. Actually, a band called the 24th Street Band. We had a band. It was uh, Will Lee, Hiram Bullock, Clifford Carter, and myself. Yeah. And uh, when Paul was looking to uh, put together a band for the show, he came to me first, and then I suggested, why don't we just get Will and Hiram? Because we're already a band. Right. So that's why we were so tight when we started. Oh, that's from how day it worked? One. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we rehearsed in uh, in my home. Where and, and fit, on Fifth Avenue? Oh yeah, yeah. In Manhattan, I have a loft. And, yeah, and um, you still have it? Yes, we still have it. That's right. You know, <laughs> when you get a deal like that in yeah. Manhattan, you keep it. Don't give it up. Yeah, yeah exactly. And uh, and we started rocking. Yeah. So like, I remember seeing you, and I remember you know Dave always integrated the band into the conversation mm -hmm. he always talked to Paul, who like uh, over time developed a weird stilted timing that. <laughs> You didn't know. It was always the assumption that he was high. Right. But, right, but you know, I think it's just after talking to him, I think it's just the way he is. Yeah. Timing. But, Timing's everything. Yeah, huh? yeah. And his is a little off. Well, he's not a drummer. No. <laughs> Most good comedians are drummers. In their hearts? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm a know. guitar player. Yeah, well, okay. Yeah. All right. And, well, uh, you know. But yeah, no, you got to know where the beats are. Yeah, exactly. uh, But it's a, it's a different instrument. Mm -hmm. But uh, I've been, you know, getting, you know who I ran into at the airport? Like, I, it's taken me years to appreciate music a, in a deeper way. Mm. Uh, like, uh, like I had this, um, I, I ran into, but anyways, I ran into Daryl. Daryl Jones. Oh, yeah, my man. Yeah, at the airport. And he oh, recognized yeah. me and we were going to London. And he was going to record, and, and we just sat down and talked for an hour oh. about, uh, about you know, rhythm sections. He's a sweetheart. He's a great guy. He's a great guy. I, I didn't what know he is. started with Miles. Why would I know that? Oh. That's one of those things that I wouldn't know, and, and now I know it, and now I got to go look for shit. Oh, totally. He's played with everyone. Are you kidding? So have you. Well, yeah, but uh, he, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but and he yeah. played together with him, too, right? Absolutely. Recently. And, uh, in fact... Um, you know, I, I like to think that, you know, that I was, uh, you know, I played kind of an instrumental, no pun intended, role in uh, getting him. Into the Stones? Yeah. Getting him that yeah. sweet gig? Yeah, yeah. Filling in for Bill? Yeah. Did, yeah like, I brought that up with Keith Richards. Like, he got mad at me, too. Uh, well, not, said, not hard to do uh, <laughs> when it comes to him getting mad. Not really mad, but I uh, said, like, yeah. I told him, I said, you know, I haven't seen the Stones live in a long time, and I was resistant because you know, you know, you know, Bill doesn't play with the Eddie board, and he's oh. like, he's like, Bill hasn't played with us in twenty years, <laughs> twenty five years. Yeah, exactly. Daryl was a bass player. It's a, I got nothing. He had nothing personal against Bill, but it's like the bass players. That's our bass player. You now. know, it's a, we we both, Daryl and I both, are kind of shocked that it's been that long. You know, 
uh, the time has flown. It seems like he just joined the band yesterday. Same thing with Ron Wood. I mean, Ronnie yeah. is, you know, you know, not an original member, but he's been in there for like 30 right. something years. And right. it's just like, it's yeah. almost like, yeah, he just left uh, Rod Stewart and right. he, like he just joined this. Th no. Yeah. You know, right. that was 30 something years it ago. It was a long time yeah. ago. Yeah. But, uh, but the conversation, and Keith is a good place to, to go with it, was that, like, I, I guess I never understood, you know, as deeply as I do now from listening more intently over the last decade, just, you know, how important, and obviously you're going to think this is ridiculous, that the rhythm section is the whole band. It's, I mean, in a lot of ways, it's all of it. Absolutely. I listened to, yeah, I, I listened to a reissue of, uh, Get Your Yaya's Out. Mm -hmm. And I'm listening to Charlie. And Bill, and I'm like, holy shit, if they didn't keep this together, it would be a disaster. Like, it would be a disaster. And me, and Keith talks about that, too, in terms yeah. of Charlie. Well, he, first of all, uh, his love for Charlie is is, is really, really deep. Yeah. And, and they have a, a connection that, you know, that is a bond that's unbreakable. That's, oh, yeah. That's, that's, yeah. That's, that's the first thing. Uh, but one, one item of note is that... Uh, Keith is a great bass player. Is he? So he played bass on Street Exile. Fighting Man. Yeah. And he played bass on, you know, uh, you know. A lot of Exile, you know, I think. You know, yeah. You know, Jumper Jack Flash, you know, all that, yeah. you know, all yeah. that, you know, a lot of great bass playing was done by Keith. Uh, and, and Ron Wood is a great bass player, too. So they know what the bass is, the function of the bass. Right. And, 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 uh, some of their, most uh, kind of rocking his tracks yeah. were done with basically like Keith and Charlie, you know, alone, and then they built off of stuff. Really? You know? Yeah. So Keith, Keith, um, I don't think people realize the the magnitude of his brilliance, you know, in because the it's, studio. It's so simple. In in, in it, what what's what was awesome to me was when I saw them. I went and saw them in the last tour at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Is that they don't use any fucking backtracks. You know, they're, they just up there playing and it fills, it's very simple stuff, but it's, it's the stones. Am I wrong? No, you're not wrong. There's, you know, the band has a chemistry. Uh, most great bands have amazing chemistry. But you've the, built stuff from the ground up with him. What is, what, tell me more about why he's misunderstood. I, I think that, uh, you know, um, Simplicity is sometimes uh, mistaken for uh, stupidity or whatever. You right. know, people they're afraid to to um, or they don't understand that less is more. Right, space and the space in the music is just as important as what you're playing. Mm -hmm. That's all part of it. Mm -hmm. You don't you take a canvas, you don't fill up the canvas with yeah. a bunch of paint. Right. You know, you 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 you, you paint a picture right. you're playing the song. He plays the song and of course being such a great writer, yeah. he writes the song. Right. So the music is there. Yeah. And you don't just fill in the space for the sake of filling in space. You know, like you know, the word tacit is very important. Yeah. In 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 syncopation. Right. You know, that's the whole thing. The push and pull of rock right. and roll. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And um and you have that in obviously in jazz and blues it's the same thing. You don't fill in every space. No, you want to hold back. Yeah, well yeah, and, and and breathing is a very important. It's the same thing in, 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 in symphonic music. Mm -hmm. When there's a space, it, there's a space for a reason. Yeah. So yeah. that when you do play something, it means something. Right. You know, right. yeah, yeah, and that's the same thing for like for drummers who play too many fills. Uh, you know, well, so that means that nothing you you're playing really counts, really matters because you're playing too much. Right. But when you play something, when you don't play a lot, and you're just holding the groove down, and then when you do play that, whoa, yeah, you know, yeah. that must have been that that yeah. means something. That's yeah, wow. and it stands out. Right. Well, I mean, I want to talk to you about working with Chuck and and Keith because and because Chuck's another guy where, you know, that rhythm is is a little like. um it's tricky, like the way he, you know, runs, you know, where he, the way he hits that guitar. Absolutely. Well, he developed a style. Yeah. He invented something. Yeah, but that bounce. Yeah. You, well, I mean, the you know, uh, uh, on a, a musical uh, description of that is, you know, and this is where jazz comes into play. Yeah. Uh, in the in the uh, kind of development of rock and roll. Right. 
So you have two of the main architects of rock and roll are Chuck Berry and Little Richard. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And they were playing, and uh, at, at the risk of sounding too technical, they were playing like eighth notes, straight eighth note. Da 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 da. Right? Yeah. So either Chuck is playing that on guitar, do 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 do. Yeah. Or Little Richard on the piano, which is basically kind of a boogie woogie type of thing, you know, coming from what Fats Wild, you know, those guys, right? Yeah. Now, the drummers that were part of the development of this style rock here's where the role comes in right <laughs> they were playing what essentially is jazz against the straight eighth they were playing what you call a dotted eighth nose yeah. ding did ding ding did ding 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 so now you have ding 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 and that's the push and pull right 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 yeah yeah it's not just everybody going you know it's not like you know a german marching band right right no it's swinging and it's doing that thing that's where the drums come in so like earl palmer who developed that thing with Little Richard. He was the drummer on yeah. all that Little Richard stuff, yeah. or most of it, not all of it. But um, he, all he ever wanted to be was Max Roach. Same thing with Charlie Watts. Yeah. They love Max Roach. They love Elvin Jones. They love, you know. And they, so they were playing jazz against <laughs> ding, 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 ding. Same thing with Fred Bilo, who played it at Chess, who yeah. was the drummer who played with Chuck and with Chuck Berry and, and Muddy Waters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, and then that. So his drumming with Willie Dixon on bass. Willie Dixon is walking. Yeah. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah. He's walking. He's yeah. jazz. He's yeah. playing jazz. Yeah, boom, yeah. Boom, right? And so that's where that is. So that's that's what happened. That's it, the development of this new style born in America. It's got a rock and roll. That's the roll against the rock. It's got a swing, though. It's got, it's got the swing. Yeah, you know, some drummers can't do it. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> yeah. And, and, and that's how you get the... The generic bar band sounding, the people who can't swing. They're staying right on top of yeah, it, they right? Just go, that, 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 you know, yeah. everything is squared off. Right. You see? And, yeah. and, um, and that's the thing. That is the, uh, that's the secret sauce. The swing. Yeah. The you got to be able to do it. Either you, you have it or swing. you don't. You, exactly. And, but like, you know, mentioning all these guys, where did you get educated? I mean, how did you come up? Where, where did you start? I was very, very fortunate. Uh, I grew up in New York City. You did. And in New York City, uh, the uh, New York City Board of Education yeah. was uh, a, a, a tremendous source of inspiration when it came to developing children in the arts. Yeah. And, you know, obviously uh, the arts have been under assault for the last 40 years in regards to public education. I went to a public school. And which one did you go to the fame school? Uh, well, actually, I went to music and art high school, which is actually the fame school is performing arts. Oh, okay, the performing arts is our annex. Oh, okay. okay, yeah, you were uh, the original Fiorello H. LaGuardia High School of Music and Art. Yeah, was the main school. Yeah, and it was right in the middle of City College yeah. in Harlem on 135th Street and Convent Avenue. But before we even got there, when you were in elementary school. You were the first day of school. You were given an, a musical instrument to take home, and and you you were assigned an instrument, either it was a violin or a clarinet or whatever. Yeah, and that was that's all part of developing uh, a full human being. Oh, absolutely. And you and, were you were given drums. I wasn't given drums. I was. I ended up playing in the percussion section. The right. first thing I ended started playing was actually. The concert bass drum. Then I graduated to to timpani, and the timpani is really boom, where boom, I, boom, re- boom. Yeah. yeah. And and so, you know, my, um, you know, my upbringing in 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 symphonic music is really where I get uh, develop a discipline. Yeah. Right. Right. And, so, but and, that's a, that's an important point that you know, to engage in a musical instrument is part of a well-rounded person in a absolutely lot of ways. so you either that or you were an art student or yeah. something but like but that was part of the arts yeah being a creative person is part of development of, of the total psyche of a human and uh you know unfortunately that's been under assault in the last 40 years and 30 and also years. you know dismissed or just not found interesting i mean i, I get uh, at some level i guess 
you know, music's not for everybody, but creativity and engaging your imagination and learning how to express yourself is certainly important. And yeah, there does, there does seem to be a shortage, whether it's uh, well, funding or not. Yeah, well, it's, well, it's been taken, it, 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 not even taken for granted. It hasn't been really completely acknowledged by a certain group of people sure. who like to right cut the budget cut the budget yeah <laughs> you yeah, know, you know. yeah yeah they, they they see it as a waste yeah exactly i mean I, I put it this way i am uh, a friend of mine took me to uh an msnbc party yeah. uh several years ago yeah and i'm uh at this party and i'm talking to andrea mitchell and then uh and then she turns and she says oh meet you know, so and so, and it's Alan Greenspan, right? <laughs> you know, Head and of it's the like, Fed. I had no idea that they were actually a couple at uh -huh, the time. It uh -huh. was like this. Yeah, you know, I had no idea that. Yeah. Were... Right. But the point is here is that, you know, he's a clarinet player. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. this is the guy who's you know telling everybody where the money is. Yeah. And he plays clarinet. You know, and I I, I said you know you want to make a record. You know, I yeah. mean, but the thing is, he's, <laughs> he's all of these people that I met. They were all like musicians. They all either played an instrument or they they can't wait to to work is over until they can run to and and they have their own little bands and all kinds of stuff. Sure. And here's a guy who all he wanted to be was Woody Herman, uh -huh. you know, or whatever, yeah. you know. Uh, and, and, he, and he went uh, on Benny to Goodman, you know, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, and uh, but no, but he figured out what to do, and yeah. now he's the smartest guy when it comes to money. But that's all part of no. of the thing. In fact, uh, when I started reading music, yeah, I became a better a better math student. Timing because, and you well, know, because be, you have to read; it's all yeah, num numbers. Yeah, and, yeah. and 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 my mother was very frustrated with my math skills yeah. uh, at first. And then I start and then I, and then I started reading music, and I became a good reader. And then my math got better. So yeah. they're all there. It's they're all, all connected. Worked, it's all connected. But when you're coming up, so you go you, you go to high school at the uh, well, so music and art high school. I, I auditioned for the school, and, and I and I got in. And who, like, you know, at that point, you're you're playing timpani, timpani, and a uh, timpani and an orchestra. And, yes, okay. yes, a timpani and concert snare drum, but I, no set. You don't have a set. I didn't get a set until um, right before I auditioned uh, for school. I never got a full set right away. In fact, uh, this is how what um, was missing. Well, this is this is how uh, I I I acquired a, a kit. Yeah, uh, when I started. Taking formal lessons when I was eight years old, my grandmother and, and she said, "Okay, uh, we'll buy you a snare drum." Uh, it was twenty five dollars at that time. That was a lot of money. Twenty five dollars for a Japanese snare drum, Zimgar, yeah. gold sparkle snare drum, <laughs> and, and it was like I, they weren't going to get me a drum unless I promised to take lessons. And yeah. I, so and, and be serious. Yeah. So I got it. So basically, I I was given a piece at a time. Yeah. I didn't get a whole kit, you uh -huh, know, it was uh -huh. like that kind of thing. Uh -huh. And I think that really, it was very astute, actually, uh, that whole concept, you know, like the carrot. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, if you really want it, then you'll keep working and then we'll get you. And, yeah. and, and you're listening to music saying like, well, I can't play that. Right. Until I get that. But that it's all in my head. Yeah, I need a hi-hat. Yeah, I didn't <laughs> get, the hi-hat was one of the last things I got. Oh, my God. And, and the funny story about that is um, that I got a hi-hat. And one of the first records I started playing to was Sly and the Family Stones, like Everybody is a Star and that kind of thing. And later on in life, I become friends, very good friends with Greg Rico, the original drummer. Uh -huh. And uh, he lent me his hi-hat cymbals. They're the same hi-hat cymbals that I practiced to. <laughs> now I have the cymbals. I actually own the cymbals. They're yours? Yeah. Yeah. He let, yeah. Is, is that nutty or what? It's great. That's crazy. Th those are, those are magical items. Absolutely. And when you go, when you, when you get into, you know, the big time into high school, I mean, who are your, you know, teachers? Who's influencing you? Is it always, is it, you know, coming out of symphony? I mean, do you, do you gravitate towards jazz? Are you listening to Art Blakey and those guys? I listen. The first thing I ever learned on the drums, was Art Blakey's Blues March, Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers, written by the great Benny Gol Golson. Yeah. And um, my dad, who's an architect, engineer, kind of cat, he said to me, if you uh, learn how to play Blues March, you'll be able to play anything. And that was, once again, another very astute uh, comment because yeah. it not only did it swing, but it had... All the hands, you know, 
and so develop dexterity. And then there was a solo in it. And, you know, if you learn the solo, you get your, not only your type of uh, improvisation chops together, but, you know, you listen so you get your memory together. Yeah. And, 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 uh, you know, the memory thing is very important in music as well. When you're playing symphonic music and you're playing the timpani, you learn the music because you don't want to, you're not going to count 500 bars until you come in. You play like, you know, you t you play a total of like four measures the yeah. whole freaking piece. You're not going to, you know, you better learn the music because you you're going to, if you miss counting one bar, you come in in the wrong bar, you're screwed, right? You don't want to fuck up your it, four beats. Exactly. Exactly. So you learn the music. <laughs> bum, bum, bum. Exactly. Oh, no. Exactly. You know? <laughs> You know, the, the whole orchestra turns around and looks at you. Yeah, you, yeah. Know, you, no, you idiots. You freaking yeah, nut. Your, yeah. your two notes. Your, your two, two notes. You blew that, yeah. But so did you gr grow uh, any sort of affinity for classical music? Yeah, I, I love Mozart. And you understand yeah. it? I do. And, uh, yeah, I'm very fortunate. Because um, I can listen to it, but not unlike jazz, you, you know, like I would have to go to, you know, I think music is... is always accessible in that you know either you you got a brain that takes it in and says right. like I, I can do this you know some music you know like, i don't like this whatever but it, you know to really understand classical i think that's sort of uh it's, it takes a little research well it's kind of very uh, it depends on what what uh the definition of understand really i guess so, you yeah. know what i mean right. so I mean, it's not like a lot of people understand jazz when they're listening to it either, but they know that they like it, whether it's a beat or whether it's the freedom of the improvisation. Right, right. But it's very much based on on symphonic music, a lot of jazz. Is it? Yeah, because, you know, you have to learn. You mean you know, like when big you're band playing, jazz? When you're playing through, if you're a soloist, yeah. if you're... Uh, the art of improvisation, uh, whether it's playing uh, through chord changes... Yeah. You have to have that kind of knowledge that you would have if you were a, a classical musician, because you know you have to know, uh, you know, uh, obviously when a large, it's coming. Well, yeah, you have to know what chords do, yeah, and what notes are in those chords. Yeah, but but like also, but with blues, you know, you're, you're talking about three chords, maybe right, maybe right, four, right, right. <laughs> if you're lucky, <laughs> if you want to make it a soul song, yeah, yeah. You throw that other one in. The minor, right? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. and then you know you kind of know when those are coming. Is it right. eight or twelve or what? Right. But like it, like with with jazz, like even something that Paul Schaefer said in here, you, you know, uh, that Miles said to him, like he had one experience with Miles where they mm -hmm. talked, and I guess Miles said, you know, don't play the the bass, don't play the the root, right? Don't play the root, play right. around it, right? And and that you know, to Paul was like, oh. Right. You know, like, sure. I, I don't know what that means exactly, but I kind of get it. Right. Well, you know, yeah, and well. that, that, but that seems to be not necessarily, you, you know, symphonic knowledge, but, but kind of blues knowledge, you know, or, or maybe not. Maybe that's jazz knowledge. I well, don't know. That's a combination. It's a combination of all of it. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're taking lessons, do you take lessons at, at in high school from any dudes that were like real dudes? Yeah. In fact, um, uh, and here again, another uh, amazing thing. Did you master thing that Art Blakey thing? I did. And how old were you? I was about, uh, I got it down like when I was about 10. 10? Yeah. And you, what, you spent a year on it? Well, you know, off and on, you know, just getting into, <laughs> well, see, I, cause I'm growing up, I got, the, I got Ringo in one ear, I got Tony Williams in the other ear, I got Benny Benjamin, Al Jackson, you know, Clyde Stubberfield. I'm listening to all, my, all music, cause we, the music was prevalent in the household. Mm. My dad's uh, favorite trumpet player was Clifford Brown. Then he was killed in a tragic car accident. So then he switched his allegiance to Miles. So there was Miles Davis playing. I'm a, I'm a newly baptized Lee Morgan guy. Okay, so <laughs> my first. Okay, so so um, one day my I, I'm going to my first uh, visit to Music and Art High School. Yeah, and it's in Harlem, as I said earlier. It's on 135th Street and Convent Avenue. My grandmother uh, lived on 156th and, and St. Nicholas. And so uh, my dad, who worked in the municipal building downtown, he said, look, after, we're, after you go to school, uh, go to your grandmother's house. There's a jazz mobile uh, on 155th Street. And we'll go check out the Jazzmobile concert that night. It'll be Dizzy Gillespie's 
big band. Yeah. And what the Jazz Mobile was a foundation that taught uh, jazz to kids in schools and and uh, obviously a great educational uh, program. And they would do block parties. And yeah. They, you know, block up the street and they'd have free concerts. So I go to my grandmother's house. Uh, earlier that day, um, I, I, I go and I have my first experience at music and art. And I was told to come there because uh, the jazz band, they had a jazz band. And the r- rumor had it that the drummer who was in the jazz band the term before was moving out of New York, moving yeah. down south. And maybe if I came, you, uh, I would have a shot of possibly getting in or, mm-hmm. or at least auditioning. So I get there, and the conductor is this uh, cat. I've never seen a guy that looked like this before. He's a really cool-looking dude. He had kind of like hexagon <laughs> sunglasses, yeah. a, a crisp white shirt with bell bottoms, blue bell bottoms with bold white stripes and brown kind of floor shine Chelsea boot kind of yeah, thing. Yeah. Like wild looking cat. You know, I'm like, yeah. wow. Is this like this is gonna be like this is a teacher? Wow, yeah, this yeah. is amazing. Yeah. Music and art this is already the most incredible thing experience <laughs> I've ever had. And it's like <laughs> yeah. I don't even know anything yet. I mean and so and I'm so I have this guy in my head and I like, wow, this is wild. So I'm telling my grandmother and everything. So then we we go. My dad gets to her house, and he takes me around the block, and we go see Dizzy's big band. Yeah. And I'm always going right up to the front. I want to see who's playing what yeah. or whatever. And How I don't really it? know anything, but I'm you know I'm trying yeah. to. And I look up at the trumpet section, and I turn to my father. And I said, "Dad, that's my teacher. That's my teacher. I just, I met him today." It was Lee Morgan. No shit. Wow. So you played in a band conducted by Lee Morgan? Just, just for, and he and was killed shit. that summer, actually. Yeah. So what was that, Slugs. like 70? Slugs. What was that? What year? 60 something? No, it was 72 or 3? Yeah. 71, 72. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so I, I, I did get a chance to, so, you know, Lee Morgan. Wow. And, um, and, you know, in that band, that was the first time I saw, the great Mickey Roker, who just passed away two weeks ago, incredible drummer, um, and a, and an inspiration. And so that's New York, yeah. You know, so by and so you know that's the whole experience. All the players that were at Music and Art High School, they're all a lot of them have gone on to, to big things, to, to really big things. Well, I like the idea that, like you, you know, to, to commit to a piece when you're young. And right. say like I gotta, I gotta do this. I gotta right. learn this. Is that like because I always used to believe for years, but you know, I'm I'm just an you know, I just play. I'm not a professional musician. That that in order to understand the blues, if you can't make rolling and tumble in your own, right? Sure, yeah. Like whatever that is, right? You know, I, right. I you can you you can't play it like Muddy did or or whatever. Though that that's a beautiful slide, but that somehow that song was a portal mm-hmm. in my mind, totally to understanding it. So. Right. For and, and I think Keith did it with with uh, with uh, Jimmy Reed and Chuck. Yes, right, absolutely. It, it's like I'm going to do this right. I, you know, right. It's, it, it's not going to sound like him, even though you may think it does or whatever. But it, the more important thing is is to to own it. Somehow. Yeah, own it and try to understand it. Try yeah. to get into the mindset. You know, a lot of my favorite players, and especially when I got to see them play, because that's another great thing about New York. Yeah. You could actually go and see these all legends the all the time. It's crazy. And then you get into, like, well, how are they feeling? Okay, now I'm not just listening to them. I can actually see them as well. That's incredible. And then you start mimicking them, whatever, right. you know, right, right. it takes to Little get moves. to until you get to where you're going. Sure, you know? sure. And, and and another great experience about uh, being in New York. You yeah, know, you and, know? and like with drums, like because it, it's not my instrument, I don't think I've ever really talked to a drummer at length. Is that um, well, first of all, I guess one thing you learn is that you get to spend time and be mentored by brilliant players. Right. But you also realize, like, maybe jazz isn't a great living. <laughs> <laughs> that, that too. Sonny Rollins was very upset with me when I left and went and started playing, you know, oh, Ro- the Rolling Stones. He was like, oh, I know you got to be, you know, you're going to be a rock star. Yeah. You know, whatever. But uh, You played with Rollins? With Sonny? Yeah. I, I, in fact, uh, I played with Sonny. I started playing with Sonny when I was about uh, 
18, 19 years old, and uh, we I worked with him off and on the rest of my life, basically. He just stopped playing only a few years ago. And well, I played it, with him right up until that point. Right. And in jazz, playing. like I guess the question I was, I was about to ask is, like, you, you know, once you learn the basics, you know, what are these, you know, tidbits of wisdom that you 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 gain from these these masters like you know like i i mean i i know with with guitar you know like i can go over and jimmy vivina will show me a lick and mm -hmm. like and i'll i'll just work with it for a year like you know right, he'll sure. show me two blues licks and i'm right. like oh that's that's how you get to that other thing right sure and and that's that i mean is it the same with drums um you try to work out a vocabulary of stuff that you can go to for yeah. sure but the main thing, the most uh, great jazz musicians, most leaders, they want it to feel good. They don't want somebody <laughs> to just play a bunch of extraneous stuff. Right. You know? Yeah. Uh, and um, so my relationship with Sonny in particular is he, he enjoyed my groove, so to speak. Yeah. My pocket, as you would say. Right. And because, you see... Sonny Rollins is from the Caribbean. Yeah. And my roots are Caribbean as well. And he, you know, he's written the most famous Calypso ever, St. Thomas. Yeah. So his his go-to thing is a Calypso. Yeah. No matter all the great jazz and everything that, he's, uh, in, that he has uh, uh, been responsible for. Yeah. And all this brilliant stuff, his go-to thing is a down-home Calypso. Yeah. And and that's career. a rhythm, and and that is a rhythm, and that is a kind of and these uh, uh, calypso tunes are very they're melodic, they're fun, yeah, and they bring up tempo, high spirits, yeah, yeah, into your soul, right, and that's 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 his root, you that's know, the calypso that, that, delivery system, yeah, yeah. <laughs> up tempo. <laughs> High spirits into your soul. What does right. Calypso do? Yeah. Oh, well, they, yeah, if well, you they, need well, up, up tempo, yeah, high yeah, spirits exactly. in your soul. And you dance, yeah. you know, and, and and makes you dance. What is that beat? What it, what it... Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's yeah. at the root of him. That's that's him. So, like, if you were, if you know, if you guys were working out some shit... He he would say like you know you know pop that up a little bit. Well, when we when we would play calypso during a show, and usually it's toward the end of the show because it kind of has that finale feeling, and yeah. you get the crowd into it after he's played all this in incredible stuff all night, and yeah, people yeah. trying to figure it out and everything. <laughs> yeah, like, that. like what then, just then, happened? Yeah, exactly. And then he gets into playing one of his great calypsos, and I would think of it as almost like. Uh, the hip hop section of the concert where it was just right, right. like, okay, we're I'm right. going to lay this Calypso beat down yeah, yeah. and he's going to play forever and we're going to get the crowd going and the people will be standing and dancing and freaking out yeah. at a Sonny Rollins concert. Right. Because now they can like get out of their they head. They can get out of their head and just get into the rhythm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. Like, you know, yep. They've sweat through the first hour. Yeah. <laughs> We try to figure out taking notes. You know, what, the, what happened there? And then, go, then yeah. you just kick in with a calypso and yeah. you're like, oh, thank oh, God. Thank you. <laughs> exactly. But that's an important part about, you know, show business. It's sort of like right. you, you want to close strong. Yeah, that, there you, want, you go. You want them to leave uh, dancing, dancing, not going like, I don't like, know what just happened. Yeah, exactly. My, yeah. No, my brain hurts. Yeah, yeah. Oh, they geez. got way out there. <laughs> way oh, out there, like, man. Whoa. What happened? I don't know if I can stand that again. Yeah, because I listen to like sometimes I got it now. See, now I'm going to go listen to Rollins, and I'm fortunate that I have like a handful of Rollins records in there right. that I have not paid proper attention to because I didn't know this key bit of information. Absolutely. So now I go in there with the calypso information and the you know the up tempo you know elevating the soul business, and now I'm going to like I'm going to look through that prism, right? And I'm going to see and you it. know when was so Max Rose plays drums on St. Thomas, yeah, which is basically the most famous calypso ever written. But he's not really playing a calypso beat. He's playing more like a almost like a Latin -y type of beat. Yeah. It's not a real a Caribbean yeah. type of calypso, you know. Right. So if you you want to hear some real calypso stuff, you have to, you know, dig into that. Like you know, who? Like uh uh the Mighty Sparrow, you okay. know, and stuff, you know. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, it. Yeah. That that, that yeah, I'll just yeah. be flying around. Yeah, exactly. It'll yeah, take me yeah, out. Yeah. Yeah. So what what does it cuz uh, like your groove, your pocket if I recall correctly, in whatever my first experience of watching you play was, it has a lot to do with the snare, 
Right. <laughs> That and was then, the loudest thing on television, that's for sure, yeah. I used to carry the snare drum around with me, too. Yeah. There was a drum that was made for me. Um, uh, it was very funny. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, Danny Gottlieb, who's most famous for playing with the uh, 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 Pat Metheny group. Oh, yeah. I, I, see, I missed the whole Metheny yeah, thing. I, yeah, so he played with Pat I have Metheny. a problem with fusion. I'll put it right out there. Right. Well, he's the, that wasn't really fusion. That was kind of um, that was post fusion, thank goodness. Well, it, got, it 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 seemed a little soft to me for some. Well, reason. yeah, that was like a kind of airy, spacier yeah. kind yeah. of thing. Even though there were changes involved, but uh, but there was more breathing room mm -hmm. in there. And so anyway, at a party, it was, I was having a birthday party, and uh, he said, uh, Danny said, oh, if you had your ultimate snare drum, what would it be? And I just made up some stuff, you know. Yeah, fifteen plies of this and the eight <laughs> coats of polyurethane over yeah, here. Yeah, and, yeah. and he had the drum made for me, and uh, <laughs> it was made by Joe McSweeney uh, yeah. for a, 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 a boutique drum company called Ames Drums yeah. out of Massachusetts, and it was a powerhouse. A this tank. snare drum. It was a tank. Exactly. <laughs> it was a tank. And so well, for a couple I, of years... I didn't read it wrong. You, no, you did not. <laughs> and uh, for a couple of years, I carried that drum around with me. It, you know, I didn't even take clothing. I yeah, was the, just having a trip somewhere. I just a freaking <laughs> snare drum case. The magic just, drum. Yeah. Uh, you, know, you know, a lot of drummers, you know, they have a cymbal back. You know, I didn't do a cymbal. No, just the <laughs> snare drum. And so that's what you heard on the Letterman show. Yeah. And I would, you know, go. So when we started doing Letterman... Yeah. My my first experience of playing li live television was, you know, I was in the original Saturday Night Live band. I was the second drummer in that band. The first drummer was a guy named Dawood Shaw. I was the second drummer. In I came in in seventy six. I came in in seventy seven with Bill Murray, the third okay. season. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so, my but you'd already been recording before that. I I started recording maybe just a couple of years earlier. Um, um, yeah, with jazz. Was, um, actually, my first recording session was with basically half of Wonderlove, Stevie Wonder's group. It was with Michael Cimbello, Nathan Watts, who had just gotten a job with Stevie. Yeah. Carlos Alomar, who, the guitar you know, player. the guitar yeah. player, David How's Bowie. How's he doing? He's doing around? great. He's doing a great. wizard. He's a wizard. Yeah, uh, Carlos and his wife, Robin Clark, you know, the great singer. And, uh -huh. and, you know, part of the reason why Bowie went R&B, you know, yeah. and, uh, you know, Carlos. Carlos was on the. Uh, he co-wrote Fame. Uh, okay, yeah. oh, so that was his previous yeah. to Let's Dance. I remember seeing Carlos. Oh, way before Bowie. Let's yeah, Dance. Yeah. I like, mean, Carlos, Carlos is, you know, young Americans oh, and all yeah, that yeah, stuff. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. All that yeah. Stevie Ray, I think, played on Let's Dance. Yes, he did. Yeah. Yes, he did. Odd pairing. Yeah, unbelievable play. Oh, God. What a solo. Yeah. I mean, that was, you know. Like, on Let's well, Dance? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's oh, amazing. Incredible. So that was my first session. Yeah. Um, with Stevie or no Stevie? Uh, no Stevie. Uh, it was with a guy who played a, a saxophone with Stevie um, who took Trevor Lawrence's place, actually, a guy named Danny Morales, and he put together. So was, my first session was in Studio B at Electric Lady. Oh, yeah. And, you know, th that's my very first recording session. That's the Magic Studio? And it's the a Magic Studio, and it's a ma and uh, going in there, and I thought, okay, this is, this is what I want to be doing. And spaces uh, yeah. are magic, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean... You go to Abbey Road, you go to Capitol, you go to Royal Studios in Memphis, you go to visit 2120 in Chicago, you know, uh, there are places, you know, even like in New York uh, right now, if you're not going to Avatar, which used to be Power Station, you can go to Brooklyn Recording and, and Brooklyn Great and those, Recording those, Studio or Germano Studios in, in they New hold York. the space they hold the ghosts right you know and they they, they yeah. hold the go and there's something you know the environment yeah. is there and especially well you're talking about holding the ghosts Royal Studios is and that's where you did it, the new Robert Cray record yes exactly yeah. and, and was that uh, a Stacks outlet well, no you know? it was High rec High re High Records yeah that, that's where Willie Mitchell that was his studio. And he developed the, the, you know, he tuned that room. He it was an old movie theater, okay. And uh, much like uh, the original Stacks yeah. was a, a movie theater, and he d just uh, built that room and tuned it every day, meaning just tweaking every yeah. corner of it. And oh yeah, putting up wool hair and 
you know. And, and it's still all there? It's still all there, uh, uh, you know, augmented by several cobwebs and corners it's, and stuff, oh, really? which, yeah. which we don't touch. Yeah. No, you can't. And, and it's an amazing... Oh, this, that's the only place in the world that sounds like that. No shit. You know, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of great studios still around, you know, uh, you know, Blackbird Studios in Nashville, you know, great studio. But there are certain studios that have a thing yeah. that um, that only that studio has. It's only gonna, you can only yeah. get that sound you there. You can only get that sound there. You can try. A lot of people try it, and you can Sure. There's people around. are like, you yeah. can do it on the computer. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, God, no, no. please. No. No, no, let's not go there. You can't. Uh, you, you know. So, yeah. yeah. So, all right. So, you did a little recording before, and then you're, you do, you're you're in the second wave of the SNL band, yeah. which is the Blues Brothers band. It's, it's Lou Marine, Blue, like right. Blue, 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 Blue Bones, yeah. you know, and the whole thing. So, the reason why I brought it up is because when I first walked in there, there were two mics on the drums. Yeah. That's it. You know, one the fifty seven and a kick drum and a fifty seven overhead. Not even a snare drum. I had to lobby to get a snare drum mic. You know, yeah. that's a, another fifty seven. Yeah, yeah, they yeah exa- the, exactly. The another dollars. Yeah. Another fifty seven. And the, and, the, and the engineer was a guy named Bob Lifton who yeah. like started with Milton Berle. You know right. what I mean? I mean it's <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, you know. yeah. And so when we the first day I go into uh, to do Letterman and I walk in. And they're like the, all the drums are mic'd with Sennheiser four twenty ones and it's an R E twenty and yeah. the, on the bass drum. I'm going, holy cow, this is amazing. Yeah. And there was a, a an engineer. Her name was Pam Gibson. Yeah. Or her name is Pam Gibson. Yeah. And she was the one that got that great sound. And oh it was yeah. No, it had never been done on television before, where drums were actually mic'd like they were in a recording studio. So that is why the, that four-piece band, Killed besides it. the fact that we were already a band, yeah. sounded so good. Yeah. And so now, couple that with this this you know tank of a snare drum, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, so that's all you heard, basically. Go, Pow! You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 you know, so every night, you know, between the dreadlocks and the snare drum... <laughs> You were that there. That was good. I, I remember, man. That was good. I remember Hiram too. Yeah, absolutely. No, no shoes. Yeah, it was crazy. Yeah. It was a great band. You know, great watching band. that that show and just the, the the juxtaposition between you cats and and Letterman. You know, right. who played this kind of like totally. you, you know kind of cranky broadcaster right. fella. Yeah, it was a uh, it was it was groundbreaking. Yeah, but you were on that. You did the the SNL stuff, so you backed everybody. You know, at, at different points who came through the show. But you were also in that Blues Brothers band, right? But were you in the movie? No, I did not do the film. Who was drummer on that? Uh the drummer who I can't remember. Willie Hall, the great oh. Willie, uh, Willie Hall, who played drums on Shaft. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, but he yeah, he took my play. I didn't do it. Um, I the Twenty Fourth Street Band. We had our first offer to play in Japan. You, Will, and Hiram? Yes. With Cliff Carter. And, and that we, was all music? It was no singing? No, it was singing. Oh. We were all singers. Okay. And we were like the East Coast Toto without the songs. Oh, boy. <laughs> without the, nothing, you know, good, the, nothing good about what you just yeah, said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> you, know, you know, but David Page, <laughs> you're so bad. David Page, you know, I mean, you know, those guys played, Jeff Picaro, they played yeah. on a lot of great records, yeah. and they were a great rhythm section. The way Jeff Picaro played... On the Steely Dan records sure. and Boss Gags and all that stuff, and so they 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 played they were the backbone of a lot of records coming out of L.A. that were good. Yeah, and then when Toto uh, came out, you know they they basically took that thing and then they did the thing. So we we were playing on a lot of records ourselves, but we didn't have the the hits. We didn't yeah. write the hits, so, right? So so anyway, but so, you had a following. You could but play. In- we did have a following, and we played. So we had to. We were big in Japan. Sure. So we 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 had a tour. Booked and the Blues Brothers movie was booked. Now, yeah. um, you know, in film, as you may or may not know, everything takes eight times as long, yeah. and sure. everybody, everything is yeah. low, blah blah blah. So, um, we had a tour, and I could have done the tour and then been on the set, and it would have been fine. But the producer said, "No, everybody has to be on the set at the same time." It was completely ridiculous. And uh, I felt it was more important for me to do this tour because I was in a real band. Yeah. And I really wanted it to happen. Yeah. So um, John was a little upset with me, but I had a conversation with Dan Aykroyd the night before I made the, the final decision. 
and he understood that I wanted to pursue uh, the your goal. own career. Yeah, exactly. As opposed to you know this half comedy, half you know. Well, you know, I have the original script, which is nothing like the actual. Is that true? Is it better yeah, or worse? Yeah, it's it's better. It's it's more clever. Danny is a very smart. Yeah. Person, well, that was what was interesting about the record, and also not so. He, he, I guess the movie, but was that you, you know they developed this this comedic duo, but you, you guys played real shit. You well, know? see, the, here's the difference. And this was part of the frustration when we cut a uh, brief pace full of blues. That's a good record. It's a it's 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 wonderful, and we have great we have legendary players. Yeah. Oh yeah. Know? Yeah. And Matt so Guitar the, Murphy. Yeah. When <laughs> when we played the whole the energy. Was unbelievable when we when we did that first record, we were playing the Universal Amphitheater before there was a roof on it. Yeah, and we were sound checking. We were, you know, Bob Hope was complaining we were too loud. You yeah, know, the whole thing because his house is right behind the, the amphitheater, and the energy was amazing. People didn't know what they were going to see. We were opening for Steve Martin, who was the hottest thing in entertainment at the time. Yeah, and so you know you have this thing where. You're going to see this Blues Brothers thing, but you don't really know what it's going to be. Now, we had played as the Blues Brothers on the last show of the season before. Yeah. So uh, the third season, we played Hey Bartender. Like 77? Uh, yeah. Uh, we played Hey Bartender and we uh, with the Saturday Night Live band. Yeah. And I was in that band as well. Right. Uh, and then John put together the Blues Brothers band that summer. Yeah. And we recorded and he was the serious album. about it. He was very serious about it. He loved the blues. He befriended this guy, Curtis Salgado, who kind of showed him the ropes, played him all the music, and yeah. he just fell in love with it and being from Chicago and the whole Chicago blues thing. Yeah. And it was pretty intense. So, you know, we we, we, we did the, the, the record, and... Um, you know, the record came out and it went to number one in seven weeks. We had a number one album. Yeah. Uh, we were like platinum. <laughs> and they're giving us like platinum records at the Radio and Records Convention. You know, it yeah. was unbelievable. So now the film and So the twenty fourth Street band at that point. Yeah. Is well well yeah, I was still well, I remember <laughs> playing the record for Hiram, you know, and everything, and I was uh, very excited. But anyway, so so now well, we could still do the thing. We, yeah. And and uh, uh but the film deal was signed before we sure. made the record. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, it was the whole John Landis yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. And it was just different from my way of thinking. And I'm thinking, well, we made a real live record. Yeah. It's actually a good record. A good record. It's number yeah. one. Yeah. It, we, you, we should think about you did the music. Your job. Yeah, right. we, yeah. You know, yeah. you know, the music does warrant something. I mean, it's helping sure. the life of this film. Uh, but the musicians got no respect. So basically, um, I opted to, be a real musician yeah, yeah, yeah. and um <laughs> so i didn't do the film neither did uh, paul schaefer and neither did tom scott we call ourselves the, the the triangle so you do that stuff with snl you do letterman and now like you work with booker t too right yeah and that, you know that's good but then i remember you showing up on talk is cheap because i'm like that's the dude from the letterman show he's a great drummer he's like the best and now you're playing with keith and that record's a good record yeah, it is. It's a fucking great record, man. Yeah. Locked Away? Come on. It's a beautiful song. Right? Yeah, yeah. So how does that happen? Because I, I would I would assume that looking at what you're doing now and, and sort of like that part of your career, the relationship with Keith was is a big deal. I mean, that was a big chunk of the what you were doing. Yeah, absolutely. That was another commitment when I when I I started leaving Letterman. Yeah. I would take leaves of absence to you do know, to, sessions. To, to go I you know, I spent a lot of time in Los Angeles, worked with Neil Young, Stevie Nicks. Really? Don Henley. Oh, no and kidding. And all that. And, and Doing I, what? Uh, playing playing on records and uh, actually co-wrote a song on Henley's uh, End of the Innocence album called Shangri-La. I wrote that with Danny Korchmar. And he's a drummer. Oh, Henley. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Henley, uh, very underrated yeah. drummer. You know, and, he's good, and, man. And, of course, one of our most unbelievable singers yep. ever and a yeah. great writer. So you're doing you're you're yeah. in demand and you're working. I'm working a lot. What'd you and, do with Neil? And uh we did a record called Landing on Water. Mm -hmm. 
that uh, his comeback rock album after he did a rockabilly thing and a country thing oh, yeah. and David <laughs> Geffen was so upset with him because he was, thought he was signing like Neil Young <laughs> yeah. and then he got this other thing that, yeah I remember know, the rockabilly yeah, thing and, uh, and the, he freaked out but we did this record Danny Korchmar Neil and I as a trio called Landing on Water which is kind of a has a very a, a serious cult following and uh, I don't have that record yeah, and I talked to him about it it's pretty a pretty wild record and, and working with Neil that's sort of like he's a, a genius in his own incredible incredible like incredible. what kind of instruction or what was what was that dynamic like in terms of what you have to do to accommodate Neil Young I just had to be me yeah you know I'm I play songs first and I uh, and it's all about the feel and we just got on right away cuz he's like a a lot of these guys and gals are just like um they, they're they like one-person bands. You right. Know? You know, when you see Neil Young play solo or Bruce Springsteen solo or whatever, they're like a band. Sure. And you know it could go on for a while with Neil. <laughs> and Bruce. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They could just play all night, you know what I mean? With no problem. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, so when, um, when I hooked up with Keith, it, it was a weird thing. Uh, going back to the Saturday Night Live days, I had, uh, I was uh, doing the the show that the Stones appeared on, which was the fourth, uh, the first show of the fourth season. Uh, when when they did Shattered and yes. and Beast of Burden, right? Yeah, uh, and the pants, the weird pants that right. Mick wore in the hat. <laughs> <laughs> like we were all kind of like, what's happening? What? What's going? On? What's going on here? Yeah. So um, there was a lot of security, a lot of hoopla, trying to keep people away from the band. I wasn't interested because all I was interested in is the Yankees were in the American League Championship yeah. Series. And so I was just in the the band dressing room, which was called the Departure Lounge. And I'm up there. I'm watching the game. I don't really care about what's going on <laughs> down there. I could care less. And then all of a sudden, uh, Charlie Watts, who wanted to find me, comes in the dressing room and he said, oh, what are you doing? You know, and I said, uh, you know, I'm just watching a baseball game, and and uh, and the, nobody's in the dressing room but me. That you know, yeah. everybody's trying to get close to the you know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, yeah. I don't care. So um, I'm watching the game, and he sits down next to me, and and so like I'm watching like the Yankees and I think the Royals or something, you know, with with Charlie White. Yeah, and he's trying to figure it out, and he goes. Oh, no, it's like a combination of rounders and cricket. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I guess so. You know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and that's when uh, we became friends. Yeah. So cut to like eighty four, eighty five, eight, and uh, I'm in Paris doing a record with a, a, a Duran Duran offshoot band called Arcadia with Simon Le Bond and Nick Rhodes. Wow. And so we're there. Yeah, exactly. So I'm there. <laughs> Gig's a gig, yeah, right? Gig is a gig, right? <laughs> so I'm there, and I'm in Paris. I mean, you can't really go right. wrong. Right, yeah. So um, I'm there, and, you know, road crews talk to each other a lot. You yeah. know, oh, we have the night off. Yeah, we're gonna, you know, so that crew knew that crew, and the Stones were recording at Pathé Marconi, EMI. And uh, so it was a full moon, and... One thing led to another, and Charlie invited me to the studio. So I what go, album? Uh, this was Dirty Work. Yeah. So they were doing pre-production uh, to Dirty Work, which is the way they do pre-production is is it basically uh, recording for any other unit, right? You know, but yeah. their whole pre-production thing is like, yeah, we're gonna go and record for a few weeks and then figure out what we have and then come back, right? So it's kind of, it's winter. I go. I get in a cab. I speak no French. The driver speaks no English. Takes me to the suburb of Paris. He dumps me. All the call boxes are broken. I'm freezing because I'm underdressed because I'm rock and roll, so I'm underdressed. Yeah. And then and, and uh, I'm walking out there, and I think I'm going to get arrested for loitering or something. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, yeah. it's really bad. Yeah. I'm close to tears. <laughs> and then I thought, I got to really hun hunker down here, and I start to listen to see if I can hear some music. And I just hear something faint in the background. I just follow the sounds, and I go down an alleyway, and I go up a street, and then, and boom, uh, lo and behold, I look up and it's EMI Path Amor yeah. and the big glass yeah. do doors and and I go up to and the door and and I hear the Rolling Stones. Yeah, and I just can't believe it. I knock on <laughs> the glass and this 
little guy comes in and goes, Hello, monsieur. You know, yeah. and I go, yeah, I'm here to see the stones. And the guy opens the door and lets me in. I'm like, yeah, really high security. <laughs> this is great. I walk in the control room and the stones are playing. And they're set up like they're live. It's not like they're all sitting there. They're standing up. They're playing like it's a gig. Yeah. And I can't believe it. Yeah. And I'm I'm crying. I just can't believe because I've never seen them play live. I mean, you, you know, you, you ignored them on SNL, but yeah, now, yeah. Now, just, now I'm in tears. Yeah. yeah. And so now the song is over. They're you know they play for X amount of time, and then and it's like, yeah, go in. So I go in, and everybody greets me, and yeah. and it's just a wonderful thing. And that's when. When it all started, I started working with them. From that point on, I would go every other night. Ian Stewart would call me up and go, oh, the boys need you tonight. And I would go in because Mick uh, would uh, arrive every other night. Yeah. So on those off nights, I would go and I didn't want to play drums. Charlie said, you know, play some drums. I said, no, I'm not going to do that. If I'm as a Stones fan. If I know that you're alive and some guy is playing the drums, I shoot that guy because yeah. it's like, why are you doing that? <laughs> so I played like percussion. I sang background. Sometimes I did some mock lead vocals for some songs yeah. and, and, and just, you know, and got to know them all. And, um, and, uh, uh, and that's when I first heard Keith sing in a lower register on, there's a song on that album called Sleep Tonight. Yeah gonna get some sleep tonight yeah and i thought wow if i ever work with this guy i'm gonna get him down get there. him down there yeah and which led to make no mistake make no mistake yeah you know yeah yeah what a sound yeah you know different than the uh, yeah. the octave kind we, of we can hear all of the dark wisdom right <laughs> exactly. yes yeah. what a mysterious what a, what right. a thing right and so that's when i first heard that and uh you know i think you know, to myself, when I first saw them on the Ed Sullivan show, little did I know that he'd end up like being like a big brother. You know, I mean, I it, yeah, I imagine very, that went both ways, though. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> the brother, the okay, well, come on, Keith. I, I, yeah, well, yeah, 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 sure. Um, there was a lot of that. Um, you know, I can't imagine. Yeah, you know, they're sort of like yeah. You know, I I mean, I talked to him, but it was like I don't know. I thought it was a good interview, but it was just basically me grinning. <laughs> You know, for for an hour, going really, Did they do? you know, <laughs> but like uh, he's, a, he's a smart dude. Well, that's the thing. Like he's I've so been a Stones smart. fan my whole life, and then I read that fucking book. You know, you go through your whole life thinking like this guy, he's a quintessential junkie guitar player, and then you read that book, you're like, he's oh a smart no, man, he knows a lot. He's I like, mean, a, you know, we go to the Caribbean, and we go to and and we'd be on the beach, yeah, and we'd be reading like books. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, and he's like, he'd go to the beach with a freaking book the yeah. size of a, you know, a dictionary. Yeah. You know, no. that's what he's doing. Not like yeah, with just, a tons of drinks and yeah, yeah. chasing Half a people or whatever. Time. No. No, he's, he's, no, he's like reading. Well, I mean, his knowledge yeah. of music and like, you know, what's always interesting is that it's like he can, like he plays Keith Richards, but he can play other shit. Like, I mean, he can play, like, you know, yeah, but, you know, but he absolutely. plays the way Keith Richards plays. But right. if you say, like, well, if he's, like, referring to Robert Johnson or something, he'll, right. he'll lay it out. Absolutely. <laughs> he can absolutely. do it. Yeah. Yeah, but, but so, like, when you did um, Talk is Cheap, I mean, that, you were, you were writing with him? Yeah. We were in the, we, in fact, uh, uh, the story goes that the first writing session that we did, um, we just went in and we started playing together. Right. And apparently, we were in there for like thirteen hours without a pee break. You know? Right. We just Is that went true? In. Yeah, I think so. I mean, that I kind of, it's all hazy to me. I know that. Um, I, I joke about him cutting at least five years off of my life because of this smoking, yeah. secondhand smoke. I would leave working with him with a pain in my chest. Okay. Oh, because you know, yeah, because yeah, because you know, it's like I'm like I'm looking at this at the <clears throat> at the songs and like I know this record really well. Right. Like I listened to the shit out of this record because right. I was a big Stones guy, but I was a huge Keith guy. And I remember like, that's, is it Bootsy Collins on it, right? Yeah. On the first cut. Yeah. Like I remember big that. Enough. Yeah. 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 Boom. Yeah. 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 There you come in. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, with Bootsy, you know, boot, there's like two lives of Bootsy. There's like the James Brown life and then there's Bootsy's solo life, which yeah. is a whole different thing. Where the, the, he kind of became like the Jimi Hendrix of the bass. You yeah, know, well, only, of, only took trains, I think, and buses, right? <laughs> yeah, well, was he, well, wasn't he afraid of flying? Well, I don't, yeah, maybe. Quite yeah. possibly. I know Aretha is, but, you know. But, I mean, the thing is, he would play with his, 
you know, when he played that stuff, you know, like uh, get involved and and uh, talking loud and saying nothing, that kind of stuff with James Brown. Yeah. There's a certain style. And then, of course, when he joined Funkadelic. Yeah. And then he whipped out the thumb a la Larry Graham and he started playing that way. That's a different style of playing. Yeah. And so, uh, so I said, okay, I said, we're going to get Bootsy to play on this thing. And, uh, he started to play and he was doing the second part two Bootsy. Yeah. And I said, no, 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 no. I want the, I want the other Bootsy. <laughs> James Brown and, he, and he says to me, oh, you want the tiptoe funk, baby? <laughs> I said, yeah, the tiptoe, you know, yeah. yeah. You know, with the two fingers, you know. So, yeah. So he gave us the tiptoe. That's and, hilarious. Yeah. And, and, but that was the whole thing. Like, <clears throat> your first solo album, you can do anything you want. You, we can get anyone you want, you yeah. know, and, uh, there was a big concern of like what we were going to do. And, and we had, uh, when Keith, uh, flew out to LA to sign the deal or whatever, to meet yeah. with the label, um, we happened to get together with Tom Waits. Yeah. And uh, that afternoon. Yeah. And Tom Waits played us a sneak, he gave us a sneak preview of Frank's Wild Years. And he played that record for us, and it blew my mind. It just completely blew yeah. my mind. And I said, okay, now I know. Yeah, yeah. We can do, we can make music. Right. We can go in and make music. We don't have to make, well, you're, you're in the Stones. People are going to expect to hear something similar to that, which is what I was most terrified about, because the Stones are the Stones. Right. You don't want to do and that. And they weren't getting wanna... along at that time? Oh, they go in and out. They, you know, you don't get between brothers. You know, they they might fight amongst themselves, but if you get in there, then they kill you. You know what I mean? Right, so, right, you become uh, the asshole. Yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, so Frank's Wild Years was very inspirational. Uh, yeah, for interesting. Me. Yeah, and so that's just because of the space. <laughs> no, just because of the songwriting, the it's sound, cool. yeah, everything. And, he really you know, went out there, and and you know what is you know it's a big it's a story. Yeah, and. So I thought, okay, great. And it really freed my thinking up as far as, as, far as going in with the approach yeah. of what we can do and what we can't do. And that led to the, the Hail, Hell, Rock and Roll thing? and Well, that actually came out of that. But Oh, you uh, did Talk uh, It Sheep after that? Yeah, I, oh. believe, I believe that's how it went. But is that uh, where you first, uh, like, you, you were you sort of uh, part of putting that band together? Yes. I brought uh, Keith to the bottom line to see... Uh, Joey Spompanato, the NRBQ, which was yeah. probably my favorite band at the time, and he played bass. Yeah, and we, uh, you know, we wanted somebody, you know, a Willie Dixon type, somebody who understood that. Yeah, and Joey Spompanato understood that. And yeah, he played it, and, he, and Keith had never heard Joey play before, and and so uh, uh, we, I took him to the bottom line. Which is a club that no longer exists in yeah. New York. It's an NYU cafeteria right, now or yeah. something. Yeah. Uh, but um, and you got Johnny. And and then Keith's main thing was to get Johnny Johnson. Yeah. To turn the world on to Johnny Johnson. To for for Chuck to finally pay proper tribute to Johnny Johnson, and for us to experience what it's like to play with Johnny Johnson. Yeah. Uh, because basically it was Johnny Johnson's trio that Chuck. Hijacked. Hijacked. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. And, and yeah, dealing with Chuck and Keith. Yeah, I got it. Unbelievable. <laughs> uh, you'd be yeah. lucky you lived through that one, huh? Yeah, I, I'm telling you. It was close. <laughs> was it, that, well, I was a kind of. Um, uh, I played referee. Yeah. You know? Uh, two hotheads. That way. Two, two very passionate people yeah. about what they do. Oh, okay. That's a more diplomatic way of <laughs> yeah, putting it. Yeah, there you go. We had this guy working with us who thought of himself as a kind of a technical guru yeah. sound guy. Right. And so they rigged up this thing where they were going to control Chuck's sound from under the stage. Oh, boy. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you know where this is going. So yeah. Chuck goes to the amp and it's not really doing anything. Yeah. Not good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and so... Chuck susses it out and freaks out. Yeah. You know, he just flips out, and rightfully so. Like, you guys are going behind his back. He's going behind his back. This is a movie about him in his home. Yeah. And he's a co-producer of it, and now you're going to mess around with his sound. You're like, yeah. he's an idiot? Yeah. Not good, okay? <laughs> and you so, well, can you imagine the, 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 the groundswell of, like, 
memories coming back of institutionalized racism and yeah. all kinds of stuff. Like, where do you think I am? I'm some freaking primitive idiot. You yeah. know, like, you don't think I know what I invented this freaking thing. Yeah. The reason why you're over here is because of me. Yeah. And now you're going to do this. Yeah. I'm going to kill all of you. Yeah. You know, and uh, that's what it, that's what was coming out. And so Keith had to take the, take the hit, take the hit. And there was a point there. Was that, did he, did he actually get hit by Chuck during that thing? Or Not that... during that thing, but the first time they met. Yeah. He got hit. <laughs> <laughs> he, he got <laughs> greeted. He's a, how I'm so, you know, yeah. Well, I guess that, you know, I imagine that Chuck, despite the respect he was getting, still the chip on the shoulder of those guys, like little Richard and Chuck Berry, for creating the sound that so many people made such big money off of. Totally. That doesn't go away. It doesn't go away. And little Richard had a little bit of, of a softer disposition sure. about yeah, it. Yeah. But Chuck, Chuck, you know, they went after Chuck. Just yeah. do everything we can to stop you, pal. There was a moment there where, the, I mean, I guess the real concern was that, you know, he played in these keys that were, you know, primarily piano keys. Exactly. And you guys were kind of, you know, just, you know, kind of, you know, moving him towards playing in more accessible keys. And there was a moment there where he wanted to change the key during the show. During right? the show, yeah. <laughs> during, after after the guys have worked everything out in these other keys. Then, well, you know what happened. <clears throat> the backstory of that is, yeah. is that he did a show the weekend before the concert. Yeah. And he did the Ohio State Fair in which he sang and lost his voice. Uh -huh. By the time we get to now filming, yeah. he's got no voice. Yeah. That's why he wanted to bring the key down oh, on that song okay. right. and all kinds of stuff. So yeah. there was like, we had to actually, I mean, it's the movie is 30 years ago, so I can say it now. We had to actually dub a lot of the lead vocals on the film. After? Yeah. With him? With him. Oh, yeah. he, so he didn't have a problem with that. He just... Well, he had to do it. He yeah. had some of the things he couldn't sing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, for people who are actually there, they don't actually remember that he had very, you know, Weak half voice. of the voice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Had, because, you know, oh, you remember the experience. Sure, sure. But we had to do a significant amount of fixing. Yeah. Um, because he sang, he blew his chops out on a freaking gig that he wasn't supposed to do, by right, the way. Right, right. Um, yeah. With a pickup band? Of course. Well, that, that, that was the thing about this film, to Keith's credit, was Keith wanted to, b besides get Johnny Johnson his props, he wanted to re-familiarize Chuck with his own genius and to show the world how brilliant these songs were. They're not, they're not all one big Chuck medley, uh, Chuck Berry medley. Yeah, that's everyone, what he yeah. had turned everything into right he had forgotten his, the brilliance of his own songs right because it was just like can you do da, 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 da. okay yeah. yeah great and i'll sing all my lyrics all yeah whatever, yeah whatever and then if i like it i'll give you a thousand bucks cash back and right that's it's it. like I'll bruce get, get in the car where, when they put we're pickup band for right, exactly what are we playing right chuck berry song exactly <laughs> exactly exactly yeah well yeah i thought you did a great job with it i mean i've watched it you know i've watched it several times cray is that where you met cray that's where we met robert you know it's weird thing about robert cray is that you know, I don't know all his records, but he's one of those guys where, like, that guitar sound, man, that straight strat, fucking, right. oh, my God. But he's besides the, b besides his sound, which, you know. He's a good singer. He's a great singer. Yeah. He's not a good singer. He's a great singer. He's one of the best singers of our generation. That's yeah. number one. Number two, his playing style, what he is playing, is not anything that you've ever heard before. In other words, a lot of guitar players, you can, oh, yeah, that's from Albert. Oh, yeah. that's from B.B. Sure. No, that's right. Oh, that's the, the, you don't get any of that in his playing. And, and he takes the same space those guys did. He's not a noodler. I he mean, is you know, he's not like, a noodler. He, Every note he plays counts. Yeah, he's a, he's got his own phrasing, he's which got, is rare. He's a very unique phrasing, yeah. and nobody can do it, and it's incredible. Yeah, and, agreed. And it's wild. So the, the way he got in the band was, uh, in 85, I'm down in Jamaica with Keith. And uh, we're listening to stuff, and we're yeah. just getting to hang out and maybe do some writing or whatever. And he I'm likes thinking, it down there, I, huh? I, yeah. And I'm thinking that I'm gonna hear, hear the greatest reggae music, <laughs> yeah, and yeah, yeah, like yeah. That. And I hear this guitar, and I hear this, he's playing this cassette of some guy, and I'm going, "Who is this guy?" You know, and it's it's Robert Cray. Yeah. All Keith was doing was listening to Robert Cray. Eric Clapton had turned Keith on to Cray, and they had the, the first two albums were two cassettes on yeah. the, the first two things that Robert ever did, and that's all I really, that's all he was listening to. I'm like, dude, are you gonna play anything else or what? You know, and that's it. 
So that's how I learned about Robert Cray. And then when we're putting the band together, then it was like, okay, we need another energy. You know, we had Johnny Johnson, Chuck Lavelle, Joey Spompanato. We needed another guitar player. Who was going to be that person? Yeah. And we're like, Robert Cray. You know? Yeah. I mean, you know, obviously you love him. And, yeah. And, like, he's like a young Chuck Berry. He's the same age when Chuck came out and, you know, the whole thing. And he had that energy and... It, it was great, and he know? did "Brown Eyed Handsome Man." Yes, that's great. That song, like, and he really made it his own because, like, he, you know, I know the Buddy Holly version of that too, right? Yeah, right. And Buddy did right, it, right? Yeah, I, I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and and you know, and Chuck's version, like, oh man, there's a that box set, the Chuck box set, where you really look at all the shit he did. It's Incredible. a lot of great songs, a man. A lot of great. He's a genius, and like, I I don't think like I think that I think that he's I think he was essential to Bob Dylan too. He's like I, that, I, he is the be, he is totally the the essential to Bob. The Dylan. turn of phrase, um, the, the, uh, the, uh, you know, like too much monkey business. That's it. That's it. That's it, like that. That and uh, can't catch me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But monkey business in particular is the bedrock of. Yeah, that I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah of of uh, leopard skin pills, you know, leopard skin pill box hat, uh, and, yeah. and and and. Mediterranean, subterranean, med, subterranean, med, 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 whatever, homesick blues. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, definitely, man. Yeah, and you play with Clapton too. Yeah, what do you you like him? You like playing with him? Yeah, it was fun. You yeah. know that um, that the band when I started it, the band that I finally played because we had talked about playing together over the years, but yeah. we, the schedules never really worked out. Yeah, and um, but we uh, got together and uh, and we uh, did a thing with Derek Trucks and Willie Weeks. And, oh right, right, right. And, yeah. and, and, and I talked to Derek. And, and um, you know, Billy Preston was alive at the time, and he was supposed to play, and he fell ill right before the oh. tour, and he died while we were on oh, tour. Oh man! So I, I was my fantasy was to get Willie Weeks and Billy Preston back together mm. and all that, and we ended up playing a lot of Derek and the Domino stuff, which I loved. And, yeah, and and. Uh, you know, Megan and I are huge Derek and the Dominoes fans. So when when the prospect came up of doing it, we thought, yeah. oh, and 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 Derek being in the band, we thought, oh man, this would be great with yeah. Willie and then yeah. Derek and yeah. then Billy. Yeah. And, you know, you played with Dylan too. Yeah, and that was good. That was fun. That was wild. Yeah, it was pretty crazy. Why? Uh, because he was in this uh, this kind of. Uh, he was searching. Well, I guess he's always Wait, searching. When was this? But this was like, uh, I don't even remember, uh, like uh, late 80s, early 90s, something like that. Yeah, you toured 90s. with him? I didn't do the tour. Uh, he asked me to put together a band for him. For which record? So, so uh, it was, I, I had the honor of playing on his, I think, I, w I would call it his worst record. <laughs> uh, Down in the Groove or something. Yeah. You know that record? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm on there. And... um he wanted me to put together a band. So I put together this band. It was a, a little hot shot studio band that we could follow him, you yeah. know, like a SWAT team. You yeah. Know, Danny Korchmar, Randy Jackson, and myself. And it became clear during the rehearsals that um, this wasn't going to really work. So I opted out. Oh, yeah. And and then they, um, and that's when I think, that's when the G.E. Smith uh, oh, okay. era, era began. Well, but uh, but your relationship with Cray. So you put out this new record. It's a great record. Yeah, uh, it, it was Thank nice you. to hear from him again. Yeah. And this is on your label. Yes, and Megan and I have a label called JV Records. Megan's your yeah. She's my way better half and great musician and yeah. songwriter. We have a band called The Verbs. Yeah, and um, and we put our own records out on JV. JV. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a classic old style yeah. label. Exactly. Sound. Exactly. Yeah. It yeah. sounds like you guys been around since the fifties. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> and so we were fortunate enough to have, uh, Missy Colazzo at MRI distribution, uh, partner up with us. And, uh, you know, for me at this stage of my career, I, when I'm making records, I like people to hear them. So I was, not very happy about making records for bigger labels, and then if they're not really behind it, the record Get lost. kind of gets lost. Yeah. So we knew, and and nobody's really funding records the way they should. Yeah. They don't really take into account what it takes to make a good record, mm -hmm. and 
you know, the first thing people want to do is not pay the musicians or not. Still. To, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, people are playing live again because you're not making any money from uh, yeah, you got to. Re- recording. You got to go play live and sell those T-shirts. Exactly. All It's all about merchandising. Yeah. And, you know, for us, you know, for producers and writers, when we start, we were the canaries in the coal mine. We, we, our zero started disappearing, you know, 20 years ago, you know, but now like nobody's making any money. And, you know, eventually some legislative action really has to take place for us to get, you know, uh, for us to be able to really make a living again in, yeah. in the studio, you know, you know, like Spotify and all these, you know, you know, kind of streaming yeah. things is like, <clears throat> for instance, I, I equate it to this. Say if you were like Whole Foods, yeah, right, yeah, and you gave out a a card to people, say, hey, all you can eat for ten dollars a month, yeah. <laughs> It'd be hard to get into Whole Foods. Be well, like, not only want- that, what would it do to the agriculture department and 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 shipping and and manufacturing all? Or you could not sustain right anything. There'd be nothing. Mm-hmm. You can't do it. Right. It's the same thing with music. You know, you ha- it's 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 the same. All of those ingredients are the same. It takes you have to cultivate. You have to grow the musicians. You have to you, you have to maintain the studios. Yeah, you have to you know. You got to pay the, more for the you, organic musicians. Absolutely, and for people who are actually really good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The the the, the, the premium <laughs> organic. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's the same exact thing. Yeah. And if people started to think of it that way then maybe we would get somewhere as far as a compensation goes. Well, people are buying the records again a bit. Well, I'm buying are, vinyl records again. Thank goodness. And and, and and there are new vinyl machines being developed and, and new plants coming up. And everything is cyclical, so it's not, we're not dead yet. Yeah. But uh, but we have to police uh, the, the revenue stream of, of the Internet where, where people get proper compensation yeah so, you have and, to people have got to do their part and you know behave you know properly and and do their part to support the musicians look if they if they <laughs> knew and that's why i use the analogy of the the you know the shopping yeah for groceries analogy because then it becomes clearer to people oh because for them it's a convenience you right. know they go well what's wrong with that i can hear all your music and it's easier for me to get it than I can listen to. Yeah, but uh, yeah, but we're not, we're not making a dime, you know. That's fucking shame. And and, and um, so that's that's a problem. Yeah, that's a real problem. Somebody else made a lot of money making that deal. It's always gonna be those guys. Oh yeah, sure. Well, the music business, uh, I say, is the only business you can fail upward. Yeah. Well, no, yeah. there's a lot of businesses on yeah. that side of it. Yeah. You know, where the executive structure seems yeah. to, uh, uh, the, the primary incentive is like, who can I blame if this gets fucked? Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then, then get, uh, you know, you're ruining the label. Why don't I give you, you ruin our company. I'm going to give you $20 million to get out. Yeah. And then two years later, they get, they've <laughs> no, been hired you, by another. Yeah. I don't yeah. know what happened over there, but yeah, we heard yeah, you good. But we, we, we think it, <laughs> it reminds me of. Remember when you were a kid and there were like uh, uh, man- baseball managers or basketball coaches that weren't very good, yeah. but they kept getting gigs. Yeah. And you go, well, how do these guys keep getting gigs? Yeah. Because they know how the system works. Right, right. They, so they're easier to, instead of breaking right, somebody new in. And they're also not a problem. Right. Like, you know, right. Like they'll throw the fight. Right. Yeah, exactly. There you go. <laughs> Hadn't even thought of it that way, but yeah. Yeah. Well, I what's the new band called? My band, no, the Verbs. Curve, curve, the, the uh, high Rhythm. Yeah, High oh, Rhythm. No, high Rhythm. So it's Robert Cray and High Rhythm. Now, High Rhythm is the legendary rhythm section from Memphis that Willie Mitchell actually developed. The Hodges brothers, Leroy Hodges, Reverend Charles Hodges, Leroy Hodges, the bass player, Charles Hodges, organ and piano, Archie Turner, also known as Hubby, electric piano, clavinet. Uh, the late great Teeny Hodges was the guitar player. You know, he wrote "Love and Happiness" and yeah. "Take Me to the River" and stuff like that. Uh, Willie Mitchell taught these guys how to play. He adopted them. Actually, they were his adopted children. And as he was tuning his studio and developing this stuff, he also schooled these kids to play. So he brought them in, back to their place. The, so, yeah, and they, they they live in Memphis. They're alive and well. This is not a retro record, okay? Yeah. Let no, me be no. very clear. It doesn't it's, sound like it. It's it's just like these guys still play great, 
and this is what we wanted. And Robert and I have been working together off and on since 98. Yeah. And um, the last couple of records we did uh, together, nobody really heard because of, for one reason or another, I'm not going to get into it, but like I didn't want to do another record like that where yeah. you pour your heart and soul into something and then nobody hears it. Right. So I, and, and Megan and I were discussing uh, a way to grow, go forward. We can't continue on this path of making these records for intermediate labels or big yeah. labels and them not supporting it. So we said, it's time to, we know how it's got to be done. Mm -hmm. Why don't we just do it? And these guys are still around. And they're around. So one day it hit me, Robert Cray and High Rhythm. So I, I sent Robert an email. I got it. And he was like, he was totally into it. And then we just moved forward. And, and Megan and I started listening to material and sending it to him. And he would, yeah, that's great, you know, boom, 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 whatever. And it just, the ball started rolling. And one key thing that we did was um, I made sure that the band uh, participated fully in the arrangements and everything. So it was a band. Yeah. It wasn't like we were hiring some right. sidemen. Right. Because that's not how it was done on those records. Right. Those great records that had full participation of so all you, the music. So it was an ensemble. Yes. And that's how you wrote and created it all. Uh, that's basically how we created the track. When was the last time these guys played in that hall? They played there a lot. Oh, they, they do? do they, they do. Uh, they they work out of there. So that's, a, that's their home. That's their home. Oh. Absolutely. Oh, cool. Well, I mean, well, I enjoyed the record. Now I know more about it. I'll go listen to it again with this Good. all this new new wisdom. Good. Good job, man. It was great Thank talking you. to you. It was great talking to you as well. Pleasure. That was fun. We learned, we laughed, we talked about music. I, I wanted to say, because Steve wanted me to, uh, to tell you, he forgot to mention the late Bob Cranshaw as someone who was a mentor to him. He was the first musician hired for the SNL band, and he took Steve under his wing. And sometimes you get talking and you forget to pay respect to the people you respect, and he wanted me to tell you that. And he wanted to make sure to, to let you know that, uh, that that guy was important to him. Pay a little tribute uh, on this episode. Uh, for Mr. Bob Cranshaw. And before we go, I want to tell you about the Harold Ramis Film School as well. Named for the late comedy great, the Harold Ramis Film School at the Second City Training Center in Chicago is now accepting applications for their year-long program. Uh, want to study at the very first film school in the world dedicated entirely to comedic storytelling and get invaluable insight and access from Hollywood vets. They're looking for applicants from all experience levels and backgrounds. So go to RamusFilmSchool.com or call 312-664-3959 to find out more. Okay? All right. I'm so, I, I won't be loopy for long. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play some loopy blues. People seem to be responding to the basics. Boomer Lee!